Good morning, everyone. Please turn to the book of Romans. We are in chapter 14. Chapter 14, the book of Romans. Paul has kind of been giving us rules of conduct, if you will. And again, as we've said before, sometimes I think we as Christians feel that we get saved, you know, whether that's at a church service we raise our hand, or whether it's on the road and we hear a teaching and we say that prayer. We get saved and that's kind of all there is to it. But there's so much more to it. We got to keep in mind that Christianity is a communal faith. And by that I mean it's not just for us. Of course it's for us. It's for our eternal salvation. But we're supposed to be evangelists, all of us. We're supposed to be living in such a way that others see their need for Jesus Christ. So it's not just so that we can get saved and then we just kind of pack it away and uh, we go, you know, I'm saved. As for me and my house, you know, we're saved, and so I'm not really concerned about my neighbor. I'm not really concerned about the guy next door. I'm not really concerned about whether my kids come to know Jesus Christ. I'm not really concerned about the guy sitting next to me if his heart's broken. I'm not really concerned about any of that. And that's why Paul has told us to not forsake assembling together. Now, if we have Scripture and Scripture says don't do that, to, to go ahead and do it is missing the mark. It's, it's missing what God has for us. So the reason we gather, the reason we hang out together is to encourage each other, to ask somebody, hey, how are you doing today? Are you okay? Because often the person sitting next to you or the person sitting next to them, they're carrying something. They're dealing with something in life because that's just the way life is. So my point is, is that the Apostle Paul in the last few verses, actually the last few chapters, has been trying to teach us our rules of conduct, if you will, being loving to each other, being kind to each other, caring about other people. It is so easy in life to worry about me and mine and then not really be concerned about anybody else. I know most of you in here, you work very hard. You put in a lot of hours. So when you come home at night, there's probably barely enough time to maybe do the homework or make the kids do the homework or make dad do the homework for the kids. You know, get the homework done, be able to get dinner done, and then maybe have an hour to yourself before you go to sleep and get up and do it all over again. And then Friday comes and uh, everyone's like, okay, it's Friday now. All I got to do is get through the day and I have the weekend. Usually Friday night, maybe Saturday, you have a little time for yourself. But again, Saturday, isn't that the honeydew day? Isn't that the day you got to mow the yards, you got to change the oil, or at least take the car down and get somebody to change the oil? You get all that taken care of. Sunday is at church. You go home. I mean, you, you go get a bite to Maybe you go home, get a nap. And then by Sunday evening, you're dreading having to start it all over again. So it's extremely difficult to live in a way that you're thinking about other people rather than just in that grind and in that routine. And yet we are instructed, given a lot of instructions about how we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to react to each other. And the church is not just a building, it's not just a place, just not a place where we gather on Sunday or we gather on Wednesday. We hear the pastor teach and that's the end of it. That's really not the purpose of the church. You do realize that when the church first started, they got so excited about Jesus, they just wanted to hang out. They just wanted to be together. They just wanted to hear about what God was doing in their life. And in that first century church, that early church, they were so much in love with each other and so concerned about each other in a very, very um, uh, world that was against them at the time that they even began to sell. Those who had things would begin to sell things and help out people who didn't have those things. Now, I'm not advocating going home and selling all that you have and giving to the poor, although that wouldn't be a bad thing. But I do think that somewhere between just going to church and going home and selling everything you have, there's some place in between there where the Lord would have us be. 
to where we are benevolent, we are loving, we are kind, and we are giving, and we don't just live to ourselves, but we live for other folks. And that's why you'll often hear the church, whether it's here or anywhere else, encourage people to come a little early and go home a little later. Because, again, that's fellowship. That's hanging out with people, getting to know who they are. If you ask the average person in the church what somebody else's kids' names were, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know what their kids' names were because we seldom take the time to sit down and ask and find out what's going on. So Paul's giving us those rules of conduct, if you will. Now, in chapter 13, it dealt with the actions and reactions with the government or authority in general. And Paul basically told them that they needed to submit to the authority, the authority that was over them. I won't go all over 13 again, but I will say this. Paul did it in such a way as to show us that submission is something that God has put in place. We all have someone we need to be in submission to. So he's saying look at submission as being submission to God, ultimately being submitted to God. Because if God wants to take that boss out of the picture, he can take that boss out of the picture. But God uses saved and unsaved people in our life to develop us, to grow us, to teach us. So he's saying basically, we need to learn that submission is not a bad thing, but that submission is a good thing. It's not just for wives, but it's for husbands too. It's for all of God's kids being submissive to the Lord. Chapter, chapter 14, excuse me, continues on this theme of Christian conduct, but this time it's more on the conscience. You know what a conscience is, right? It's that part in us that says, do the right thing. Now, for many of us, once you became a Christian, your conscience changed. Your conscience changed. Things that were permissible before are no longer permissible. Things that you used to do, you now look at them and go, well, that's just not really a wise way to live. That's not a good way to live. I know more words than those four-letter words. I probably should intelligently begin to use those. So things begin to happen in your life and changes begin to happen in your life. So Paul is talking about the root of doing something. Not doing it by the letter of the law. Not doing it because you have to, but it becoming so much a part of your life that you do it because you want to. Because love is supposed to be the basis of all of these things. Remember how high he stacks love above all the laws and all the commandments. So before we begin, I want to look at a couple verses in chapter 13. So if you look at verse 12 through 14, we will start there and we will begin. Romans 13, verse 12. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness or lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, for the fulfillment of its lusts. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in Jesus' name, and we ask that you would teach us and you would allow us to grow. We ask, Father, that you would help us to look at ourselves, not our neighbor, not our wives, not our husbands, not our kids, and the kids not looking at their parents. Let us us not look horizontally so that we can justify who we are, but let us look vertically at you, knowing we'll never be completely like you, but, but setting you as the example And then comparing our life and and asking ourselves honestly, am I loving? Am I kind? Am I forgiving? Am I benevolent? What kind of an individual am I at the core? What kind of an individual am I when all the lights are out, when nobody's watching? What kind of an individual am I when my fears kick in, when, when things get to the bottom? What kind of an individual am I really? Father, may you teach us and may you allow us to grow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Romans 14, verse 1. 
receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Christians, boy, boy, oh boy, today you go on the internet and Christians are fighting Christians. Christians are arguing with Christians over this and over that. There's like this this war going on, and in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, it's over petty differences. It's over things that really does not matter. And he's saying, receive that one person who is weak in the faith, but not so you can argue with him. Not so that you can fight with him or argue with him over things that are doubtful. Now, He starts off with this Christian who is weak in the faith. And I think that we have a tendency to think that someone who is weak in the faith is also new in the faith. Well, that might be, but not always. Some of us might not have had the privilege of being in a Bible teaching church. So this has more to do with maturity than it does length of time in the faith. Someone might come in and they've been a Christian for 20 years but they don't really know anything about the Bible. They don't know anything about what God has asked them to do. So their maturity level may be way down. So whatever the length of time since their convert, uh, excuse me, since their conversion, the one who has weakened the faith is the one who has had very little growth, very little understanding in the things of the Lord. And I know that even in my own walk, When I got saved, there were quite a few years I went to churches, and they were good churches, they were good people, but I would kind of hear the same message about giving, or I'd hear the same message about this or the same message about that, and I never, I don't remember ever in any of those churches ever going through the Old Testament. It was always in the New Testament, and in most cases, it was topical. So you can be in a church for a very, very long time and just not understand the Word of God. But Paul is saying, even if that person is a bit weak in the faith, then accept them in, but don't accept them in and then begin to criticize them because they are weak in the faith. Look at verses 2 and 3. For one believes he may eat all things... But he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let him who eats, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Now, this is just one example. But in this example, the weaker brother thinks that it's more spiritual to be a vegetarian. And there may be some folks today who still believe the same thing. While the more mature Christian realizes that spirituality is not in food and drink. It's a personal choice. But this one person, and and guys, I see it all the time, and I'm sure that you've seen it. You get a a, a brand new Christian, and, and they're kind of going along at a good steady pace, and then all of a sudden somebody comes to them and says, you're missing something. You're missing something. You need to speak in tongues. And whatever that church that you're going to, they're not spirit filled because they don't hoop and holler. They're not, you know, they're not spirit filled. You need you're you're missing something. They're not giving you the whole thing. Okay, let's take that and put it on a shelf. You go to another place and they say, "Well, you're missing it because you're not a Calvinist. They're not teaching you proper doctrine." Take that, put it on a shelf. You can pick 10 or 15 other ones and someone comes along and tells that person, you're missing it because you don't have this, because you're not this, you're not that. But they're missing the fact that they have Jesus, right? They've been born again, they have Jesus Christ. Those other things, I'm not saying some of those might not be important. What I'm saying is that if God wants that for that individual, God's going to work it out. God's going to work out those things in that individual life. We've got to be careful to where we do not think that we're more spiritual than someone else because we get on a health kick. And it's one thing, I mean, we could all be on a health kick, right? I mean, it would probably help all of us to eat better, get a little exercise. 
I'm, I'm all for that, even though I don't have the willpower to pull it off most of the time. But in a lot of cases, it goes way beyond just being healthy. Am I right? Aren't most gyms filled with people who it goes way beyond just being healthy? It goes way beyond that. It becomes a, an ego thing or a pride thing, and now I become an evangelist for that thing. It's like putting people down because they have androids instead of iPhones. The age-old debate that one's better, one's more this, one's more that. That's my opinion. That's your opinion. What I tell folks is whatever works for you. Doesn't matter what you buy. If somebody else thinks it's the best and you're never going to use it, it's not any good for you. Buy what works. PC. Apple, you know, which one's the best? That fight's been going on for a long time. You bring that into the Christian realm. Christians do that. And this is what Paul is warning us against, to be careful about doing things like that because spirituality is not in food or drink. We're just basically not supposed to sit in judgment of each other. And the reason being... Paul tells us because both of those are accepted by the Lord. Both of them have been accepted by the Lord. When that person said, Father, I commit my life to you, they became his child. No strings attached. Why do we put the strings on them? We got to be careful not to do that. Now, if God sees something he doesn't like in that individual, it's his job to straighten them out. Parents. We need to learn this. There comes a time and age in our children's lives where we have absolutely no authority. We have absolutely no control. And I have to admit, with my sons, I didn't figure that out until it was later. I should have figured it out probably five years sooner than I did. Because as a parent, they're always your kids. You always love them. You're always concerned about them. But there comes a time when they hit a certain age where you realize you're not going to be able to do anything anymore. Your voice doesn't mean anything anymore. God's going to have to take care of it in a different way. And I think we need to learn that with each other. And that is if we're concerned about someone's mouth, them still swearing, yeah, maybe we should go to them, but I don't think we should go to them without praying for them first. I think we should start praying, saying, God, if this is something that bothers you and not just me, then I pray that you begin to work on that person's life because God can straighten us out, right? God can straighten us out. Look at verse 4. Who are you to judge another person's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Now, the illustration, of course, here is a master of a household. And he's the one that handles the home. The master is the one that handles the home. Now, let's look at it this way. A normal person would not think of going into another person's house and then telling them how to run their home. You guys are going, oh, you don't know my (laughs) mother-in-law. Sorry, mother-in-laws, I just picked that out of the hat. but. But a normal person, I said, A normal person wouldn't think of going into another person's home and telling them how they should run it or how they should handle the things within that home. That's what Paul's trying to say. Let me put it in a more modern term. Maybe maybe a more modern model would be going into someone's home and then telling them how to raise their kids. Another lesson for parents. Right? Your kids are not going to raise their kids the way they were raised. At least not at first, because there's too many stupid books out there for them to read. Now, when you're a brand new parent, you're going to rewrite everything. You're going to be the absolute best parent in the world, better than your parents ever thought they could be. You're going to be better parents than them. So you read every book that you can find, and they say to put them on a schedule, don't put them on a schedule. Do this, do that. You read one book one time, and you got, you know, you got a bubble kid. 
He doesn't, they don't get out, they don't do anything, they, you know, your life is dictated by that child, and if, if 8 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock, got to get home, you know, sorry, no fellowship tonight, we got to get the kid home. So it's all dictated by that. But then you realize that doesn't work, and so they begin to change, and they begin to change that. So what I'm trying to say as parents is, sometimes you got to bite your lip. Sometimes you just got to bite your lip, you just have to leave it alone. You know, let them raise their children the way they feel that they need to raise their children. When they're in your house, that's another story. You can get them ice cream if you want. I mean, that's what a grandparent does, right? No, even then, you still have to respect their wishes to some degree. Otherwise, you know, there's a war that goes on there. But what I'm saying is, if you go to visit somebody and and you don't know them extremely well, and, and you're in their home and you see them yelling at their kids or whatever, it might tear you up inside, but you're not going to just say, hey, 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 stop. You're at a mall and you see someone just railing one of their kids. You know, it's funny when you're a parent, it seems so much different than it is when you're watching somebody else do that kind of stuff. But it's like you wouldn't, you wouldn't unless they were abusing that child, you wouldn't go up to them and tell them, hey, you really need to raise your child in a different way. Now, He's, he's kind of using this whole thing to say each person that's sitting here that's given their life to Jesus Christ, they belong to God, not you. They belong to the Lord, not us. They're, 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 not, they're not ours. The obligation that we have to them is to love them. That's the obligation we have. The, God, the obligation we have to do, have is to love them and to love them unconditionally like the Lord. But we can't control them. We can't control them. It's up to God whether or not that servant will stand or fall, but keep this in mind, God is the one who will help us stand. Remember, we don't stand because we're good. We stand because Jesus is good. So that person that we're judging, we might think we're better than them, but he's got the same Jesus. They've got the same Jesus. They are saved by God's grace and God's mercy, not by the letter of the law. They're saved by grace like we are. So he's saying God will allow them to stand because of his grace and his mercy. Now, we might want them to be different, but it's up to God to make those changes. A good lesson in marriage You know, at least those of you that have been married more than three months, you know you can't change your spouse. You might have thought you could. A lot of people get married thinking they're going to change their spouse, but you can't change your spouse. Only God can change that spouse. That's why it's a good idea to look at them very, very well before you get married. See what's inside of them. See who they are in many, many circumstances because you are not going to change it. Now, God can change it. And hopefully God changes both of them. But you can't change it. And I always use this example. The reason you can't change it is because you and I can't even change ourselves. How many New Year's resolutions have already been broken? You see, we... We can't even change ourselves without the help of God. So to think that we can go in and completely change a person is, is a little ridiculous. So we've got to put them in God's hands. Back to that whole submission thing, isn't it? God being in charge. Look at verses 5 and 6. He goes back to another example. He goes, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day the same or alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat and gives God thanks. A typical example, and I've used this before, and that is some people think that Saturday is the day of worship. And you trace it back technically, very possible. Very well might be, rather than the traditional Sunday that we hold. But why does that make any difference? 
Let's take another one, Christmas. Christmas is not really the day that Jesus was born. But we celebrate it as the day that Jesus is born. Now, we could get so high and mighty that we go, I'm not going to that church because they celebrate Christmas. They, put up, they even put up Christmas trees. They're a pagan church. These, these, this is what he's trying to say. They do, if they're doing what they do because they love Jesus, it's all right. The day doesn't matter. The day doesn't matter. I don't care when Jesus was born. I'm just glad he was. It really doesn't, it doesn't matter. We can pick any day of the week. It's okay with me. Some people have harvest festivals, and they have them in or around Halloween. People get all torqued because of that. If you're doing it as a harvest festival to keep the kids off the street in order to glorify Jesus Christ that night, who cares what day it's on? It's being done as unto the Lord. Now, you might say, well, I'm still not comfortable with it. Well, praise the Lord. That's awesome. But what Paul is saying is don't condemn someone else who is comfortable with it because he's doing that as unto the Lord. Your conscience won't allow you to do that. Okay. That's awesome. Doesn't make you better than that person, and it doesn't make that person better than you. This is what he's trying to do to say if it's done to the glory of God now here's what I'd like to say as a Christian isn't every day Jesus' birthday shouldn't it be shouldn't every day be the Sabbath yes every day we should be resting in Jesus Not just one day a week, but every single day we should be resting in Jesus. And shouldn't a Christian be able to celebrate any day he wants in Jesus' name or every day in Jesus' name? He should be able to do that. Now, remember, Paul is dealing with the weaker brother. As a mature Christian, we realize that every day should be lived to the honor and the glory of God. That's maturity in the Lord knowing that every single day should be lived that way. And thanks should be given to the Lord for everything that we eat. Although it's a stretch to do that with the cheeseburger and fries. Or maybe the banana split. You know, there are some times when you look at the meal and you go, eh, uh, I, I really don't know if I should bother the Lord with this one. But the reality of it is, it should still be, if you're, if you're going to eat it, then your conscience is free to eat it. Give God the honor and the credit and the glory for it. That's, that's all that he's saying. Somebody else may not touch a hamburger and french fries. They, they feel that it's poison. They can't do it. They don't want to eat it. Well, praise the Lord for that too. He's just saying that you've got to be careful about judging each other over things that spiritually have no significance. Look at verse 7 through 12. For none of us lives to himself. No man is an island. No one lives to himself. No one dies to himself. The entire lifespan of any man or woman, you're not by yourself. There are other people that are involved. People find that out real quickly when they married. A lot of things that you maybe did when you were single, you can't do it anymore. There's another person in the household. The more people in the household, the more you got to be considerate of each other. No one lives or dies to themselves. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now he's talking about born-again Christians. People who are given their life to Jesus Christ. Whether we live, we should live to God. If we die, we die in the Lord. But we are the Lord's. Verse 9. For to this end, it says for this purpose, this is the whole reason that Christ died and Christ rose and lived again. That he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Look at verse 10. This is really important. 
And you might want to underline this one. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show condemn, excuse me, contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us should give account of himself to God. In other words, when I stand before the Lord, he's not going to ask me, how do you think Beck did? He's not going to ask me that. When she stands before the Lord, he's not going to say, how do you think John did in his walk? My kids, they're not going to be able to say, well, it was this one's fault or that one's fault. I'm not going to be able to say, none of us. It's going to be just an account of us. We kind of live in an entitled society. I, I think it gets more so that way as time marches on. And you hear people all the time blaming everyone else for their actions. Well, I'm this way because I've been persecuted. I'm this way because I did this. I'm, I'm this way. You're that way because you're that way. You're that way because you've made some really lousy choices in your life. There are other choices to make. You've made some wrong ones, and those need to to straighten up. So what he's saying is, when we stand before the Lord, we're going to give an account for us, not for anybody else. We're not going to be able to blame anyone else. We're going to have to give an account. You had Jesus, and you chose not to receive him. Or you had Jesus, but you didn't use him. You didn't allow him to be useful in your life. God is ultimately the controller of life. He's the giver and the taker of life. And he throws Jesus in there to show us that he showed all of mankind that he is God of the living and God of the, de- of the dead. Excuse me. So whether we live or die, he should be glorified if he is our God. And we should do our best to allow him to be glorified even when things are tough, guys. And I know that's harder I know it's harder. I know when you're sick. I know when you're down. I know when you're dealing with a disease or you've got something else going on in life. It's really hard to rise up and call him blessed. But you know it's probably more important at that time than it is even when you're on the mountaintop. Mountaintop is a dangerous place. Mountaintop is a dangerous place. Spiritually, the mountaintop is a dangerous place. Physically, worldly, Materially, the mountaintop is awesome. You can have things you've never had before. You can do things you've never been able to, to do before. The mountaintop is, a, is an awesome place, but spiritually, it's a bad place because things begin to take the place of God. It doesn't have to, but it really can. Let's get back to this judgment seat. If we're all going to stand before the Lord, what's this all about? Will Christians stand in the judgment seat according to this? Yes. Christians, Christians will stand before the Lord, but it won't, be before, it won't be for salvation. When we stand before the Lord, this is known as the Bema seat. When we stand before the Lord, when Christians stand before the Bema seat, it'll be for what we've done in Jesus. Whether we've allowed him to really be God of our life or not. There will be a certain exchanging of of, uh, crowns and rewards. And at the end of all of that, we'll place them at Jesus' feet and enter into his rest. But there will be that moment when we'll see what we could have done and what we did. What we could have been, but what we really ended up doing. Now, why would God do that before we enter into eternity? I think it's because we begin to understand that we don't deserve anything. Even though we're Christians and we think now we got it wired, we don't. We still make mistakes. We're still unloving and we're still unkind. And I believe we're going to feel that for a moment. But we're going to put all that back in the hands of the Lord and we're going to enter into his rest. And I think what that's going to do is create such a love Such a love, such a a gratitude of God saying, but I love you anyway because you're my kid. And we get to enter into his presence. Now, there's another, the rest of humanity, they're going to go into the great white throne judgment. That's going to be for salvation. 
It's basically going to be, I gave you Jesus and you refused him. I have another place for you. You're not going to enter into my rest. You're going to re- enter into eternal damnation. That's just the way it is. Revelation 22:12 says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Now, that means my work needs to include other people, not just me. What's, what's that reward going to look like at the end of my life? Am I going to be a giving person? Am I going to be a loving person? Am I going to care about other people? So, Paul's question, again, why do you judge your brother, or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all have to stand before the judgment seat of God. Let's not judge each other ahead of time. Let's let God take care of that. That time's coming, let's let God take care of that. Look at verses 13 to 14. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. But rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and I am convinced by the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, that might sound as clear as mud, but actually it is very, very clear. Paul is saying, don't major on the minors. There are some things in the Christian faith that you and I cannot budge on. And that's mostly Jesus. Mostly everything that has to do with Jesus. There are things we can't budge on. God has clearly spoken to us on those things. But there are many, many gray areas where it's not a matter of doctrine. It's just a matter of preference. And Paul encouraged us once again to not lay our trips on other people unless God has spoken about it. Specifically but to not lay those on other people. Now, here's something else. He's saying that we need to also be careful to not enforce our liberties on someone else. If someone else is convinced that this thing is not good for them, you you don't wave in front of their face. That's unkind, that's unloving. That's just just an unloving thing to do. If you have the person over here that's a vegetarian, weak in the faith or not, vegetarian, and it makes them sick for somebody to eat red meat. And they invite you out to dinner and you get the biggest, juiciest, rarest steak you can get. Because you want to prove to them how spiritual you are. That's me. That's not, that's not spiritual in any way, shape, or form. That is just downright mean. There's no love in that. This is what Paul's saying. Although he considers one maybe to be a little weaker in the faith. Paul says, I'm convinced there's, there's, there's nothing unclean before the Lord. But he says, I won't use my liberty to stumble another individual. You see, you and I have to rise above our rights to what's loving and what's kind. What's the right thing to do? Okay, because you see, the person who's convinced that it's wrong, to them it's sin. To them it's sin. So if we cause them to stumble, we're like making them sin. All right, look at verses 15 through 23. It says, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Now, let's take it out of the food realm. Let's take it out of the food realm. Let's take it into... Let's say that there's somebody, and forgive me for this because it's a little rough analogy, but let's say that there's a a lady that's been raped. And uh, she's done her best to forgive the rapist. The rapist has since given their life to Jesus Christ. And the rapist has to be, if happens to be a friend of yours or a relative of yours. 
and you know the story and you know the situation and on Sunday morning you come in and have the rapist sit next to her to see if she's really forgiven. That's just mean. That's just mean. There's no love in that. There's no spirituality in that. There's no kindness in that. In that case, the really immature one, the really weak one, is the one forcing this upon somebody else. That's what Paul's trying to say. If you have a brother or sister that's a recovering alcoholic, and they're doing their best to go day by day by day, it would be unkind to sit with them and drink. And they might even say, oh, it's okay, I'm, I'm past that. No, they're not. Never past it. You're never past it. Don't put them in that. Don't put them in that setting. Just don't put them in that setting. That's making them relive all the nightmares and all the horror stories all over again. It's just not, it's just not kind. Okay, therefore, verse 16, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may build up one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. If, it's, if, it's, if it trips him up, then he can't do it. For it is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Now, you might say, that, so that means I got to live my life on the basis of a weak brother. I gotta live my, I've got to alter and change my life because of, of them not being mature enough to handle it. Let me ask you a question. Isn't that the definition of love? In all honesty, isn't that the definition of love? Doesn't a husband give up some of the things that they want to do in order to love his wife? Doesn't a wife give up some of the things that maybe they want to do in order to love her husband? Don't, the, don't they both give up a lot to, to love their kids and raise their kids? Isn't that the definition of love? Didn't Jesus give up getting, up getting off of the cross because of love? It wasn't the nails that held him. He was there because of love. So he's saying, you may have this liberty, but be careful with it. Careful where you use it and how you use it and don't stumble, don't hurt anyone with it. Verse 22, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is the one who does not condemn himself in what he approves. I would even say happy is the one who does not condemn another in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. In other words, if, I'm, if I know that I'm doing something and it's, not, it, it, it's, it's bad for me and I do it anyway, I'm, I, it's a sin for me. It may not be for you. And that doesn't have to be one of the big ones. That could be almost anything. If you've got a brother that's trying to quit smoking and they're really trying to quit smoking, it's just flat out mean to light one up in front of them. Right? It's just just mean. Okay. I want you to look at verse 19. We're going to close up here. Pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Pursue the things that make for peace. Now let me ask you, are you a peacemaker? In your life, in your family, are you a peacemaker or are you a troublemaker? A lot of times, it's a matter of choice. How are you doing? I'm fine. That was a choice, right? There's, there's a million different ways you could say that. I'm, I'm all right. I just don't feel well today. 
Well, I'm okay, but something's going on at work. There's a million different things you can, you can color that with to not make it sound like you're mad at the, uh, at the world, especially whoever's asking you if you're okay. Didn't take out the trash yet? What's up with that? <laughs> hey, you can color that a different way. Honey, have you taken the trash out yet? You always, always forget this. Honey, did you forget that we need to get this done? You see what I'm saying? It's, it's very easy to change that around. We don't, we don't have to be... We don't have to be ugly. Well, some of us can't help that. But, I mean, we don't have to... (laughs) We don't have to be mean, you know? We don't have to be mean. We can choose to be a nice individual. You know, we really can. A lot of times it's a matter of choice. Even if we don't feel well, it still is a matter of... Of choice. So, guys, as a church, and my encouragement, not just as a church, but even down into our families, let's not dwell on the things that divide us. Let's not make a big deal out of the things that the Lord doesn't care about. And even in your marriages, a lot of times we make a big deal over nothing, don't we? Over nothing. Did you lock the car? Hey, how come I always have to lock the car? <laughs> how come I'm the one that's got to get the toothbrushes out at night and you never get them? I don't know where that came from, so. (laughs) We make a big deal out of nothing. God didn't die for toothbrushes. He didn't die for locking there, unlocking the car. He doesn't care about those things. He's more concerned with my conscience, with my heart than he is about any of those things. So, verse 21, it it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything which stumbles your brother or do anything. Underline the anything. We can't say, well, yeah, but my thing, he didn't mention that one. He put them all under anything. If it's going to hurt someone, it's not going to kill me to not do it right there. In other words, guys, love trumps liberty. Love trumps liberty. 